We welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel. We pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of his word. To my church family, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I look forward to the day, I long for the day, where we will be able to worship again. This is the second part of a two-part message on the perfect parchment. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, and in verse 16, last video, we considered that the command is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. In the last video, in part one, we examined the doctrine of inspiration, what it meant, and how the Lord uh, wrote the word of God, uh, breathed the word of God into men, and they perfectly then wrote down uh, what he said. We had an excellent example of that, and we also considered how Satan is uh, in an unyielding attempt trying to get rid of the Word of God with King Jehoiakim in the book of Jeremiah. We know that Satan will not be successful in uh, extinguishing the Word of God from the face of the earth. There will always be the scriptures here on the face of the earth. Where Satan is being very successful, though, is in us. The command, let the word of Christ dwell in you. The word dwell means inhabit. Let the word of Christ inhabit you richly. And Satan is uh, being very successful sometimes in our lives. When we um, extinguish the word of God, we let something else inhabit our lives, and it's not based upon the Word of God or the principles and truths of God's Word. And so I want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 again, where Paul's remedy to combat Satan's onslaught is quite simple. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and again we'll start in verse 1, we read this in the last video. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And then the simple command, preach the word. That's what the Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to do in his ministry. Preach the word, be instant. And the word instant means uh, constantly in duty, literally to stand by or to stand uh, fast by. He was to uh, be pressing and urgent in the performance of his work. He was always to be at his post and was to embrace every opportunity of making known the gospel. Uh, that's what the word instant means. Be instant in season and out of season. Preach the word. That's what people need. That's what we need to have in our pulpits. That's what we need to have our fathers doing in our homes. That's what we need our mothers doing to teach their children. Uh, that preaching the word, be an instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's what the world needs. It's what our churches need. It needs the Word of God to be permeating richly in our lives. Uh, the rest of the verse we will, or the rest of this portion of Scripture we will discuss in just a moment, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Turn with me again to a portion of scripture that I think we read a few videos again uh, ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 17. Again, Paul's remedy to combat Satan's onslaught against uh, trying to extinguish the word of God from our hearts. Let's start in verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptize, 
but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. Uh, catch that. Um, the Apostle Paul was not a great orator. He was not a smooth speaker, and quite frankly, neither am I, stumbling through and sometimes stammering and uh, struggling with reading words. And yet the Lord has called me and given me uh, a gift and the ability to preach the word. Let lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Yes, the time will come when some will not endure sound doctrine. It will be foolishness to them for uh, to think about actually going to a church where all they do is preach the word. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased the God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Greek foolishness. Imagine what the Apostle Paul must have faced in his day, time, day uh, when he was on the earth, and it's uh, quite similar to uh, a pastor or a Christian who understands that the world, all the world needs is the word of God in their lives. Um, the world is not seeking the word of God. It's not hungering and thirsting uh, for the word of God. They're not desiring the sincere milk of the word. Our churches today are full of uh, entertainment. They're full of uh, contemporary Christian music. They're full of everything except the word of God. And we find that here, um, that the Apostle Paul was facing the same um, struggles, if you will, that we were. Verse 24, but unto them which are called both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Um, excuse me, I have lost my place. Yes, there it is. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many mice went, wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. When you think about when Christ came to the earth and he chose his disciples, he didn't go to the Sanhedrin. He didn't go to uh, the higher learning places. He chose the uh, many of them fishermen and tax collectors. and um, that That's who he chose to spread the gospel, to uh, give the uh, earnest expectation of the faith that was once delivered to the saints. It was once delivered to the saints by fishermen and by tax, collector, tax collectors. Yes, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Verse 28, the base things of the world, the things that are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Um, Paul's remedy to combat Satan's onslaught, to get rid of the word of God, was very simple. It was asking young Timothy, who sometimes could be uh, a little timid, and uh, others to just simply give people the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God and a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then these men and women are to be sharing the word of God with others. That's what this world needs. And of course, especially at this time. So I want to now, if you don't mind, go back to Second Timothy uh, chapter 4, and I want to discuss uh, the fact that uh, Satan's most uh, strategic and successful strategies are to today 
are the fables that uh, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's uh, begin in verse 3. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe we are living in these times that Paul predicted, and that should be uh, that should give you great comfort and great uh, assurance that uh, the Lord knew that these days were coming, that there was going to be a day when those uh, who call themselves Christians, uh, they won't endure sound doctrine. The doctrine won't be enough for them. They need something else. And what is that? Well, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. These fables, that uh, is what I'd like to discuss for a few moments. Um, and uh, again, I believe that this is Satan's most strategic and successful strategy in our day and age. The fables that I believe that the Apostle Paul is talking about are humanism, liberalism, modernism, relativism, and eventually new evangelicalism. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, uh, humanism would be, uh, a simple definition would be bringing God down to man's level. Uh, liberalism involves the evolution of human reasoning and judgment above the Holy Scriptures. It denies the inspiration of God's Word and leads to unrestricted criticism of any biblical viewpoint or position. It is a total denial of God and His Word. Because there is no unifying, unifying discipline, there are many di divergent views among religious liberals, liberals. Modernism is that theological position which rejects any or all of the Bible as the Word of God, denying the supernatural elements of the Bible and the miraculous character and the person and work of Christ, magnifying the false doctrines of the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. I'll explain those in just a few moments. Modernists emphasize the social gospel as opposed to the New Testament gospel of grace to an individual. So uh, I'm going to say a statement, and I want you to um, see what you think about the statement, okay? Um, that the Word of God, the Bible, contains the Word of God. What do you think about that statement? I'll give you just a second to think about it. When uh, you first hear it, you say, okay, that sounds pretty good, that the the Bible contains the Word of God. But actually, if you were to actually consider what it means and what it's saying, it's the modernist view of Scripture. And it's completely false. And it has the hiss of the serpent because it sounds so good. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. So we take one word and we change it around, and Satan is a master at doing that. Yes, liberalism or modernism, um, those who uh, follow this way of thinking, uh, they say, yes, the Bible contains the Word of God. And in so doing, they actually reject that the Bible is the Word of God. In our last video, we stressed the fact that from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, that all of God's Word, all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. Uh, the Bible does not just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Uh, other factors that um, uh, some are, are many liberalists or are modernists, even in, and we're talking now about uh, religions. We're not talking about uh, maybe a, a political liberalist or, or modernist. We're talking about religious liberalism here. I want to make that uh, very clear. Uh, Jesus was a good man, and yet it, it's so much more than Jesus being a good man. He was the God man. Um, one of the things that um, Satan wants to attack is the deity of Christ. And uh, just simply uh, looking at all of the false religions of the day, they all attack the deity of Christ, whether it's Catholicism or Mormonism or uh, some of the other uh, 
Jehovah's Witness, they all don't believe that Jesus is actually God. They believe he's a son of God or, or uh, one of these things, that he is a created being uh, by God, just like you and I. Even in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Behold, a young maiden shall conceive and bear a son. Uh, that is a liberalist view of scriptures. Of course, we know that the birth of Christ was supernatural, and that it just wasn't a young maiden. It was a virgin that conceived and bore a son. We know that the Catholics uh, make uh, Mary uh, on the same level with Christ, and uh, Mary is was just a human being, just like you and I. She was a sinful human being, and so we, we, we find the, the liberalist, the religious liberals and their views attacking the scriptures. Um, God is the father of all men, the universal fatherhood of God. Um, that's not true. God, in one sense, yes, it is true, but uh, you'll remember or would maybe like to read, we won't turn there, but in John chapter 8, Verse 44, the Lord Jesus says that ye are of your father, the devil. <laughs> so only God's children are uh, have um, God as their father. Uh, only those who put their faith in Christ is are the children of God. Not all. Um, not all men are brothers. Not everyone belongs to the same family. There are two families, the father and his family, those that are saved, and the devil and his family, those that are um, unsaved. And I know that sounds very harsh, and I know that sounds very unloving, and yet it's the most loving thing that I can say to someone who's not saved. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, ye are of your father, the devil. Uh, man is a product of, of evolution, and we know that's not to be true. Uh, man was created directly by God, and this leads, and I do believe that evolution is not a science, it's a religion. Uh, to, uh, if you, you follow or understand anything about evolution, it comes from the inherent view that man is good. Now, if you are a Christian, you understand that the exact opposite is true that man is inherently bad. And uh, if you are following someone who ha has some uh, liberal tendencies in their churches, um, that becomes a very, very great problem because it contradicts uh, the word of God. Man is the unfortunate victim of hereditary and environment, but through self-culture and self-effort, he can save himself. That's the liberalist view, uh, even in religion. Um, how many times have you heard, well, I had a bad upbringing, or, um, well, he just got up, got caught up in the wrong crowd, or he's not a bad kid, but he just, you know, and we hear this uh, sentiment all the time, and it, none of those things are true. You cannot blame your upbringing on how you turned out. Think about the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve um, were brought up. It was a perfect environment. And what happened? They failed. Why? Because we are inherently bad. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, many roads lead to heaven and man can be justified by his good works. Uh, all men will be uh, eventually saved. These are some of the thoughts of uh, the liberalist view of Christianity. Uh, no loving God would ever condemn anyone to hell. Um, and so uh, the love of God is overemphasized. And again, there's nothing wrong with scripturally knowing about the love of God. It is a beautiful truth. And yet it can be overemphasized a lot of times. And I try to explain this to many uh, that I talk to, especially who I um, have a burden for that may be going down the path of liberalism in Christianity, I will uh, admonish them that a lot of times it's 
uh, not what the pastor says. It's not. It's what he doesn't say. It's what he doesn't preach on. And so, um, judgment and God's holiness and some of these very true sound doctrines are not preached in churches. There's no warnings against false doctrines and false teachers. Um, and we, we need to be very careful uh, about um, what men uh, are not saying. And the reason why they're not saying them is because people have itching ears. And, um, uh, you know, if you say something offensive, well, that person may leave and then their, their tithe check may leave. And so um, what is our motivation as Christian pastors? pastors, um, I trust it is to just simply preach the word and trust the Lord. Um, liberals will recognize and tolerate many faiths and many um, faith expressions. Uh, they seek union with all other types of churches and faith. There is an undue emphasis on the social gospel. Um, the church's responsibility is not to feed the poor. If you look at the epistles of the churches uh, from Acts to the end of the scriptures, uh, you don't find a um, emphasis on socially the church helping the world. The way that the church needs to help the world is in a spiritual sense. If a person has a need, that need to, needs to be met spiritually, and then the other needs will be met. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. No, there needs to be a separatist view of Christianity, separating from churches and individuals who are moving in an ungodly direction. They seek to meet man's physical needs with food, clothing, and medicine instead of their spiritual needs. Again, I'm not saying that uh, when someone comes for you to help that you can't help them physically, but uh, in our churches today, there is an uh, undue, um, uh, an overemphasis on uh, feeding the poor and making sure that, um, you know, all of the uh, social as aspects of life have been met. And uh, many of these people are doing it for what they think is a good reason, and yet they're not following the pattern of Scripture. The modernist thinking of today has crept into our churches. Uh, the preaching and teaching of God's Word is not enough anymore. This really was uh, shown to be true in the late 1950s, excuse me, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, when there was a great shift in Christianity a man by the name of Harold Ockengay in um, California came out and said, you know what, I think we need to uh, rethink a bunch of things. Uh, there was going to now be a friendly attitude towards science. We were going to uh, start rethinking what the scriptures say about creation. And so now today, possibly you could even ask uh, many Christians what they believe about evolution. And they would say, oh, no, that, that could be true, or they be actually believe it to be true. There was a willingness to re-examine the beliefs concerning the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit, which would allow the Charismatics, the Pentecostals, the healings, and the speaking of tongues to be uh, more invited in churches. And of course, um, if you truly understand the New Testament scriptures, you'll understand that um, the uh, church today does not have the ability to speak in tongues or laying on of hands or the healings um, that uh, many Charismatics and Pentecostals, the second blessings, if you will. There was a more uh, tolerant attitude toward varying views of eschatology the last days, and um, there is a, uh, a wide discrepancy on uh, when uh, people believe that Jesus is going to return. Um, dispensationalism is a very big word, but uh, not used much today because of uh, the liberalist view. There was an increased emphasis on scholarship, um, a more definite recognition, I've already mentioned this, on social responsibilities, and then a reopening 
on the subject of biblical inspiration uh, to the point now where that if you were to go to many of even uh, Christian universities today and ask the students, do you believe that the Bible is inherently inspired? Uh, many of them would have to say no. Um, a growing willingness uh, towards conversing with liberal theologians. Instead of separation and separating from them, uh, let's let's discuss things. Let's, let's have a dialogue. And uh, again, very, very dangerous. The, the sat Satan is... Um, has a uh, very subtle but a very successful tactic nowadays. Um, so as we move forward to April of 2020, what does uh, what the, the shift in Christianity that happened in the late 1940s, what does it look like today? The rapid rise of the church marketing movement in the late 1990s to the present with its emphasis upon relationships and experiences, drama and contemporary music to reach and hold people. Um, if I was to give you um, a definition of what it looks like today, it would be the emergent church. Uh, if your church uh, begins their services with uh, this praise music and they repeat over and over and over again one stanza, um, you need to watch out. What's happening is, is they're trying to move you emotionally and get you in such a place where basically whatever they say is going to be okay. There doesn't need to be the preaching and teaching of God's word. Um, it's not enough for many today. They need to be entertained. They need to be coaxed. My wife just showed me uh, a post on Facebook uh, this uh, last night about the fact that if you come to a certain church, and I don't even, I would tell you the church, because um, I'm not afraid of naming names, that's for sure, but I, uh, the church was, uh, if you come to church on Sunday, um, you'll get a roll of toilet paper. And it's just, it's amazing what people are being drawn to in uh, the uh, world today. That it, um, it, it, frustrates me. It saddens me of what pastors actually think they have to do to try to keep people coming to church. If um, the Word of God is not enough for you to keep coming back to church and to worship in spirit and in truth, then I'm not sure that what's going to help you uh, keep coming to church. What is it that's satisfying you? We know that uh, in the emergent church today, there is the acceptance of all faiths and, pe and people, no matter what they believe or no matter what their lifestyle is. And that's just not simply uh, the truth of God's word. Um, I have a dear friend who uh, gave these five uh, thoughts about what the scriptures really are and should be in today's society the message of the gospel is exclusive. Yes, the message of the gospel is exclusive. And uh, churches don't want to hear that. Pastors don't want to practice that. The fact that um, if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Jesus is not one of the ways. He is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The gospel is exclusive. The fact that Romans speaks about the fact that all have sinned, that's very offensive to many, and pastors are shying away from this. The certainty of the truth is intolerant. Yes, so one of the isms that I spoke of earlier is relativism, and essentially it just says, well, you know, it could be right. And no, no, but the scriptures don't teach that. The scriptures say that everything is black and white. The certainty of, tr of truth is intolerant. The be belief in the Bible is extremist. If, if you actually take what the Bible says and say, well, yes, uh, the Bible still says that I need to spank my children, and yes, it does say that women need to be keepers at home. All of these things are in the Bible, and yet they're thought to be so extreme and offensive and intolerant today. And the fact that the scriptures say that separation from error 
is commanded, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Separation from error is deemed unloving. Because of the deceitfulness of Satan and his perversion of the scriptures, when someone says, I love Jesus, the question could be asked, which Jesus and which gospel? Is it the Christ of the Bible, or is it the Jesus of modernism, liberalism, and even now today, new evangelicalism and the emergent church, where you can't be sure because of the relativism of too many who call themselves Christians? Can that Jesus save you? Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I want to show you that there's more than one gospel and there are uh, different types of Jesuses out there. And uh, my burden is that uh, for you that are listening today, that you know if you, that uh, you are following the Christ of the Bible, not the Christ of the Catholics or the, uh, the Christ of the, uh, you know, name any of the, what I would call cults today. Galatians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 6. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Galatia says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another, and that's uh, the word, uh, the Greek word, another of a different kind, another gospel. You see, there's more than one gospel out there, and when someone stands up and says, I love Jesus, or Jesus died on the cross, you must ask yourself, what does this person believe about Christ? Um, if you asked a Mormon what they believed about Christ, they would say that uh, uh, Jesus was a created being. He's not a God. If you asked a Catholic, they would say, yes, uh, they uh, Jesus died on the cross, but then you also have to go to a priest. and uh, That's a different kind of gospel, which is, verse 7, which is not another of the same kind, uh, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And yes, that is one of Satan's most successful and strategic strategies today is perverting the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have that ye we have preached unto you, the scriptures say, let that man be accursed. As we said before, it was so important for Paul to get this across, he repeats it in verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Yes, there are many gospels out there today, and there are many Jesuses out there today. My burden is that you are following the Christ of the Bible. It's not very difficult you need to read God's word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and you will know for sure which Jesus and which gospel you are following. The Lord Jesus would say in John chapter 10, verse 35, the scriptures cannot be broken. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Yes, the scriptures will always be on the earth. The only place that the scriptures can be bro broken and can pass away is in you. That's why the command was given. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let, you need to let the word of Christ inhabit you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. As I close, I'm just going to simply read some beautiful verses from the Psalm, uh, the Psalms, and they're all from Psalm 119, and they all have the word, word, in it. So Psalm 119, if you'd like to follow along, I'll probably do this very quickly. Uh, Psalm 119 and 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. In verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 16 and 17, I will delight myself in thy statutes, another word for uh, the Bible. 
I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Verse 25, my soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thou me according to thy word. Verse 28, my soul melteth for heaviness, strengthen thou me according to thy word. 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Verse 81, my soul fainteth for thy salvation, my hope, but I hope in thy word. 89, Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. 105, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. My path. Psalm 119, 114, thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. 133, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. 140, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. 160, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. 162, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. And 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all, all thy commandments are righteous. Yes, uh, I am so blessed for having a church family, and I told them not too long ago what a blessing it was for me to know how many churches they drive by to get to our church. Um, some in our, my church family drive a very long distance. We rent a building, which isn't open right now, but we rent a building that is quite a ways away for some of them. And yet they travel a very long distance to get to a place because they know by God's grace that they are going to hear the word of God preached, that they're not going to be entertained. They don't have to come in and get uh, earplugs so that the, uh, because the music is going to be too loud. The music is going to be very reverential. The hymns are going to be sung because we have a desire to worship him and worship him in spirit and truth in a very specific way. Yes, Satan would like nothing more, as in the garden with, in Adam and Eve, he would like nothing more to keep you from letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And he has been attempting and will continue to attempt to extinguish the word of God in America, in the world, and in our hearts, in ourselves. We can combat this by putting our faith, our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and studying God's word. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that I was brought up and the godly men that um, influenced me to understand that it's going to be the simple preaching and teaching of God's word and nothing else that that is what we all need. That's what the world needs. Help us to be sharing God's word at this time, giving um, a uh, very appropriate portion of scripture to someone in need and allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work in their lives and in ours. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.